Hi, this is Ms. Litton, and this is a seventh period review for Honors Bio Unit 6. Say hi. Hi. Um, can somebody hit the light so you can see a little bit better? Okay. So if I was going to focus on, um, on different things to know, okay, what's the very first thing we talked about? Okay, but even before that, we talked about DNA structure, okay? And then not only did we address DNA structure, but we talked about how you take DNA and make more DNA. What's that called? Replication, okay? Then the second big topic we talked about was when you take DNA and you form what? RNA, okay? And when you take DNA and form RNA, what's that called? Transcription. Okay, and then the third thing, third thing, third thing we talked about was when you take RNA, uh, I didn't know what I was writing, and you use that to form a what? Protein. Protein. And what is that called? Translation. So don't get those just names mixed up, okay? Make sure you know what you're talking about because um, the bummer is I have a lot of people who know about the different steps, but they forget the big ticket names and then they miss a question on it, okay? So let's start with the first part. If, if I was going to talk about DNA structure, are you guys, I can't say anything more because I'm waiting for a moment. How much more time do you guys need? Okay, so let me work backwards, okay? Just because, can you, add, can you answer the last question for me, please? Just answer the last question, for sure. And then don't change it. Got it? And then don't change the last question. Deal? Are you done then? No, okay, that's fine. Okay, so let's talk about DNA structure first. So if I asked you how DNA is built, what would you tell me? Twisted double helix, good. All right, so tell me more. Oh, that's a terrible pen. Tell me more about that twisted double helix. What's, what's it, what else? Be more specific. Okay, so you would tell me it has a sugar phosphate backbone. What else would you tell me? Okay, complementary uh, nucleotides. I would say that DNA is actually built out of two strands of nucleotides, right? And you would know that you have a purine, right, that binds to a what? Pyrimidine. Okay, and purines bound to those pyrimidines, okay? Um, we know how many hydrogen bonds between A and T? Two. And G and C? Three. Okay? Um, what scientists told us that that's, you, we could expect A with T and G with C? Yeah, Chargaff told us that. What scientist told us that DNA was our hereditary? I don't know if it logged out for a second, I apologize, but we talked about DNA being built out of two strands of nucleotides and purines with primidines. And Hershey and Chase were able to identify that DNA was the hereditary material because they labeled the phosphate, and they, which would be part of the DNA, and they labeled the protein, which would be part of the capsid coat on the bacteriophage, and it turns out it was the nucleic acid that went in, okay? And then when we look at um, the structure of um, DNA being a twisted double helix, who came up with that structure again? Watson and Crick, but who did they base that information on? Rosalind, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, right? So those, they did that about the um, twisted um, helical nature of it, and then it had a constant diameter. And who else? Who what other information did they base that on? Chargaff about and with the A T G C. Good. All right. So on your double helix, you want to be able to tell me on the nucleotides um, what, how a nu an RNA nucleotide would look different from a DNA nucleotide. Would you know how to do that? So let's let's break down the new. We are talking about DNA, but tell me. How is a DNA nucleotide different from an RNA nucleotide? 
Okay, so DNA has thymine, whereas RNA has what? Uracil. Uracil. Give me another thing. Two strands, and this has one strand. Give me another one. Deoxyribose is the sugar, and this one has ribose. Good. You're welcome. Was there something else, though, difference between DNA and RNA? We know that RNA is made from DNA, right? Mm -hmm. RNA gets its sequencing of amino acids from the DNA. The other thing I would say is if I took a portion of this DNA, this portion right here, what could you tell me that that does? I mean, generally speaking, what does DNA do? Why do we have it? Codes for what? Our protein. That's the point, right? DNA is our genetic material and it codes, it's in charge, it's the brain of our cell. It codes for all of our proteins. But what are proteins built out of? Amino acids, so it codes specifically for a series of amino acids, right? And those amino acids will build the protein. That's how, so if you wanted to relate these three words, DNA, cell, amino acids, proteins. How could you relate those words together? Thank you. You're welcome. Good job today. Thank you. Oh, okay. How, um, oh wait, you saw another thing. One of the things, two steps in school were a chance to look at tests. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Tell, what, anybody want to give me that? Okay, so now make another direction for me. How about the DNA codes for amino acids, which build proteins, which direct the cell, and what the cell is going to do. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, it's in the review. Yeah, it's in the review. Yeah. Okay, so then the second thing is, if I was going to talk about DNA replication, if I was going to work my way through, I haven't heard anything. Sorry, thank you, checking on email. Um, if I was going to talk about the steps of DNA replication, would you know how to give me those steps of DNA replication? Okay, tell me what those steps are. Unwinds, unzips. Who does that? Helicase. Good, give me another one. Yeah, and brings in free nucleotides, mm -hmm. right? And you, it would be important for you to tell me that when you bring in those free nucleotides, it brings it in complementary, right? And that always works, right? Remember we talked about leading and the lagging, lagging strand? And it only, DNA only works in the three, three to five prime um, direction. So it works really quickly on the leading strand and the lagging strand and kind of has to back. Stitch it. Remember how we talked about it goes a little bit slower. Yes? Is three or five the lagging strand? It, it always can only read in one direction, always the three prime direction. So if it's the leading strand, you know, where, remember how we go like this? If it's the leading strand, that means three prime is right here. Mm -hmm. If it's the lagging strand, three prime, so it has to like back it up and go, back it up and go, back it up and go. And that's why it just replicates so slowly. Okay. It always replicates in the same direction. Kind of like we always drive on the right side of the road. So, you know, so if you wanted to go some way and you were on the other side, you'd have to back up and move, you know, in order to keep driving on the right side of the road. Okay, so DNA polymerase, what else is another enzyme we use? Ligase. And you would use word, I don't know what I'm spelling here. You would use word, what am I starting to say right here? Some. Yeah, you would tell me that it was semi-conservative replication because each old strand serves as a template for a what? New strand. New strand. I meant to change colors there, but it didn't happen. <laughs> and if you were doing something like this, whether it's DNA replication or transcription or translation, you could always use the colored pencils in your um, box of fun, right? To make it so I could read it and tell whether or not you were making, you know, when, if you were going from DNA to RNA or an old strand and new strand, you could use that to kind of help yourself out. These are steps I would know how to diagram. DNA replication, transcription, trans if I was like, you know, pondering, I would know that. Okay, 
So that, that's this first part. Um, so be very comfortable with the purpose of DNA and DNA structure. And knowing now the second chapter, right, the ne next chapter we did, does every single bit of DNA code for a protein? No, right? Not every single bit codes for a protein because some um, code for tRNA, some codes for rRNA, some are landing sites. Right? They don't code for anything. They're just a landing site. Name a landing site for me. What? Oh. RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. promoter. That's a landing site, right? And then we talked about the regulator gene, which codes for a repressor, and the repressor likes to bind to the operator. operator. That's a landing site. So what I'm saying is when you look at DNA and I said, basically, what does it do? It codes for amino acids, which are our proteins, okay? But there are some other parts on here that are landing sites for things in order to do DNA replication or in order to do transcription, yes? Or to control transcription. Did I confuse you at some point? Jojo, you did? The re yeah, the repressor, the yes, the repressor lands on the operator. And you know what, this, the lac operon, you know, this is in the 50s when they came up to this, and you have no history of this in your lifetime, and really I don't either, except for I had a friend who lived out of town, and they used to have like party lines, and a long, long time ago, maybe you've seen a movie where somebody calls into a town, and then there's like a switchboard, and they say, oh, who do you want to talk to? And they would plug it in and say, oh, you can talk to the Jones, and they would plug it in. Have you ever seen an old movie where they do that? Okay, so the operator controls everything. It's kind of like if you called into the hospital, whoever is there at the switchboard running that switchboard, right, that would be like the operator, and you would say, I'd like to talk to room somebody in room 227. Or you call Home Depot, and you talk to the operator, and you say, hey, I'd like to talk to somebody in paint, right? So that operator plays a critical role. So if that repressor's on there, it kind of shuts down the whole rest of the gene. And those would be those structural genes that we're trying to control. Okay, so there's that part. Then the next thing I'd want to be very com um, comfortable with, I just deleted something, I don't know what I did. The next thing I'd want to know about is um, the process of transcription. You're welcome. Okay. So in transcription, you're going from what? DNA to RNA, okay? Now specifically, we focus on what kind of RNA? mRNA. mRNA. And M stands for yes. messenger. So if I have a strand of DNA and I do my step still, what was my first step? I still have to what? Unwind and unzip helicase. And then what do I do? Helicase. I put the lagging strand away, so we get rid of the lagging strand. Why? I only need one strand because I'm making what? RNA. RNA. So I'll just use the leading strand. Okay? So I don't care about the lagging strand. I'm going to use the leading strand. Okay? And this time, instead of DNA polymerase, what am I going to use? Yeah, I'm going to use some RNA polymerase. And now you know RNA polymerase has to bind to the what? Promoter. Promoter. But if I asked you um, an essay about transcription, I'm not expecting you to do the whole operon thing there. I would probably ask that as another question for sure later, but not right here in this section do I expect you to do this. Okay, you just RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. Okay, and then we make a complementary strand of mRNA. So if I had um, a strand of DNA that said went um, G C C T A U uh, mm, mm, G C C T A T C C G, could you tell me what the complementary mRNA would be? C G G A. Because I have A's, right? What is it that I'm missing? Right. So what comes next? U. Yes. <laughs> Are we good with that? Okay. Now, what do we call every three bases on this mRNA? This is a codon. There's one codon. There's two codons. There's three codons. 
Okay, so now I make my mRNA, then what was our next step? Take the mRNA off, right? And then what do I do with the DNA? Zip it back up. So I remove the mRNA from the DNA, right? Because I use the DNA to build it with my RNA polymerase. Remove my mRNA and the DNA, DNA zips up. Now I need to process, sorry I'm so sloppy, I'm just going so fast. Process my mRNA. How do I process my mRNA? Cap, what else? Tail, what else? Cut out introns, yes. Cut out the introns and I leave the what? Yes. And this is why I can use one strand of DNA and get a whole bunch of different mRNAs, right? By depending on what I cut out. Yes. No. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. And then the next, now it can leave the nucleus. So I've made my mRNA. That, that process is transcription. We all right? Questions you want to ask me? Okay, so let's talk now translation. Okay, and translation is a really good, really good word to use because I'm translating from a nucleic acid language to a what? Protein language. They're different languages. They use different letters, right? In, in RNA, I'm talking nucleic acid, right? But when I talk protein, I talk what? Amino acid, right? Amino acid. Do you see how there's two different languages there? When we went from DNA to RNA, it's still the same language. We were just transcribing. You're transcribing right now. I'm saying words, and I'm assuming most of you are typing in English right now. But it is still the same thing. It's English, right? If you were translating it, you would be listening to my words and then typing in Spanish or something. That would be that would be translation. Okay? So here we are with our translation. We have mRNA. Okay, with its series of bases, it's going to leave the um, nucleus, right? And it's going to come out. What's the first thing it needs to do if I want to translate it? Before the anticodon, i got to have a workspace. RNA, that's part of a ribosome. So first, the mRNA hooks up with the small ribosomal unit. And now the first tRNA lands. Okay. And remember, on our ribosome, okay, we have a, a small and a large ribosomal subunit, but we have three spots. What are the three spots that we have? What's this spot over here? A, and this is P, and this is E, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, right? Do we still have that in this country? I'm not sure. Okay, anyway, so the first tRNA lands, and it's going to land actually in the P site. The very first one is going to land in the P site. Okay, then um, first tRNA land in P site. Okay, then number three, we're going to have not the small ribosomal unit, we're going to hook on the what? Large. Okay, now we're ready. tRNA1 is landed, and then who's going to land next? Yeah, then tRNA2. I don't know what I'm writing. tRNA2 um, lands. Now let's talk about what we mean by lands, okay? What has to match is on our tRNAs, and T stands for what? Transfer RNA. It has on its feet, it has what? What's this right here? Ooh, hi. On its feet, what does it have? Yep, that right there is the anticodon. And I would probably draw this like matchy matchy out as an example. And on its head, what does it have right here? What does it transfer? Amino acids. That's an amino acid on its head. And its feet is an anticodon. Okay, and if my anticodon here is um, 
GGU, okay? Then the mRNA, the codon, right? That's my codon on my mRNA. Codon on my mRNA would have to be what? CCA. Mm -hmm. And this codon is determining what anticodon binds to it, and that anticodon is determining what amino acid, and who ultimately determined the codon? The DNA, right? Because the DNA, if we took it back, the DNA that codes for this codon would be what? G, G, T, good, on the leading strand. And then you could even tell me it was on the other side of that, couldn't you? Yeah, okay, so tRNA1 lands, tRNA2 lands, and then um, the ribosome shifts. And it's always shifting and it's dropping whatever's on the P side off on the A side. So it's like always shifting right, okay? And it's dropping um, off the amino acid um, on the P site, it's connecting it to the A site. So we could say number six, um, amino acid um, one binds with, and you even know what kind of bond that is. What's the name of that bond? Yeah, say it. Peptide bond. It's a peptide bond with amino acid, what? Number two, and then tRNA number one, what does he do? Leaves. Because he was in the, what, E site. And then what happens next? tRNA number two is now in the what site? P site. And then tRNA number three is in the what site? A site, and this continues until you reach a what? Stop codon. Is there any of what I, that mess I put on the board that you don't understand? Yes? Wait, talk louder. Oh, because what happens is when you put, here, let me go somewhere, let me go somewhere. New page. Okay, so let me draw a ribosome. Let me see if I can, and we have our three sites, which are what? P, no, A, P, E. Okay, so let me put these all together so they stay together. Did you see what I was on? I wasn't on that. Okay. So, this is here's your rib here here here's your rib here's your ribosome. Let's put some mRNA out there. Oh, good, it did stay together. Okay, and now we can bring some tRNAs. So let's make a tRNA. Now let's make another tRNA. Okay, so what happens is the very first tRNA is, is on the P site, right? Just the first one lands there. But from then on, they land on the A site. Right? And so what happens is the ribosome, the ribosome shifts. So here we are. The ribosome shifts once it drops the amino acid off. So now this first tRNA1, the blue one, he's in the exit site, and the guy that just landed is in the what site? P site. And then another one's gonna come along, right? Another one, I'm picking up a pen. Another one comes along and he lands right here. Okay, and then the ribosome, and, and, and at this point, this guy's gone, and this blue one got attached on here. 
okay? And then this ribosome is gonna shift again, right? Oh, wait, we're here, we're here. Ribosome is gonna shift again, and when it shifts, this black and blue one is gonna land on the next one. Right, and then he's gonna be in the E site. And so as it just keeps shifting, it's coming along and ultimately just reading, um, okay, it's just reading that the, as, the rib as the ribosome is moving along, it's just building it until it reaches a codon that says what? Stop. Yes? So the mRNA just kind of like goes into cytoplasm after this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that happens. And you could have several ribosomes like read, 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 right? Until that ends up getting digested in some way. Okay. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Yeah, so it's like something you need a lot of copies of. Good. Okay, what else? Did that help you? Okay, so we have reviewed the steps of transcription, or replication, transcription, and translation. And then the next part that we talked about was control, right? Some all, and there were literally five steps of control. What were the, what were the five control pieces? Chromatin. And chromatin. And remember we talked about having loose DNA or DNA that's all tightly coiled up. What do we call the tightly coiled up DNA? Heterochromatin, and this is euchromatin. What's an example of heterochromatin? Far bodies. This, yes, the second X chromosome is a good example of heterochromatin stays condensed, like in females, it's one or the other, right? Okay, and we saw calico cats, you know, and all that. Okay, so what's the second level of control? Trans yes, transcriptional control. Now, transcriptional control has two options. You have the prokaryotic option, And this is about the operon, and this is about regulator genes coding for repressors who like to go get on operators to prevent RNA polymerase from getting on the promoter. It doesn't allow it to do that, right? That was one option. The second option in eukaryotes was a little bit different. In eukaryotes, it's not so much about the no, okay? Because a repressor is all about no, you can't copy these genes. In, you, in eukaryotes, it's more about the yes, and the yes are things called transcription factors. And it's the job of the transcription factors to help RNA polymerase bind to a promoter. Okay, chromatin structure, transcriptional control. Let's move on to another one. What was the next one? Post-transcriptional control. No, I'm just gonna do that. What are all the post-transcriptional controls? Yes, cap, tail, cut out introns, and the speed that you leave the nucleus. Those are all post-transcriptional levels of control. Okay, give me another one. What is it? Yes, translational. And translational is all about a uh, translation. Can you, can you bind with a ribosome? You know, how long are you doing translation? You know, those types of things. Anything that could interfere with translation. I probably talked about in the classes about the small interfering RNAs that can come and bind and make the RNA double-stranded instead of single-stranded. Okay. And then, what's the last one? 
post-transcriptional. No, post-translational. Is that what you said and I just missaid it? I'm sorry. Get it right. Okay, so this has to do primarily with the folding, the important folding um, of the amino acid chain so that it is a functional protein. Are we okay with that? Okay, then when we talked about all these, we really did focus initially on the whole lac operon. So when you talk about the lac operon, let's talk about DNA. So here's DNA. What are some different regions on that DNA? Yes, the regulator genes. <laughs> Is that what you're gonna say? Yeah. And the regulator gene codes for a what? Active repressor. Okay, and this is usually farther upstream and separate from the operon. From here on out, it's operon. Okay, so tell me another part of the operon. Promoter. Who likes to get on the promoter? Yes, RNA polymerase likes to bind there. Okay, what's right next to the promoter? Yep, operator. And who likes to get on the operator? The repressor likes to get on the operator. And if the repressor's on the operator, then there's no go for those genes because RNA polymerase cannot get on the promoter. But we're okay with that because we don't need these genes anymore, or right now, right? Just like your light should be off in your bedroom at home right now. But if we do need it, for instance, in the example that we talked about, we talked about lactose. And lactose, because it's called a lac operon, is known as an inducer. You say, come on, let's do it. I'm trying to induce you to do it. And the presence of lactose removes the repressor so RNA polymerase can get on the promoter. The genes get transcribed, and what do they get transcribed into B? Enzymes that will do what? Digest lactose. And when all the lactose is gone, then it can't prevent this anymore, and the repressor gets right back on the operator. So it's a way. Don't make stuff you don't need. Hey, lactose is here. We need these genes. Lactose binds to the repressor, yanks it away. RNA polymerase gets on the promoter. Transcription, translation, make your enzyme. Digest your lactose. Okay, lactose gone. All right. Nothing to pull the re repressor away anymore, and it gets right back on it. You okay with that? A little bit. Questions you want to ask me about it? Okay, um, then the next thing we want to be sure about is talk about cancer. Cancer is loss of control, right? And I suggest that you look at things like characteristics of cancer cells, you know, how, what, what are the issues with it. I also, do you remember the two genes that were really important? You're welcome, connected to cancer. Yes, proto-oncogenes. And what was the other one? Tumor suppressor genes. And tumor suppressor genes is the one that we talked about was P53. And that's if you have an out of control cell, they will cause what? apoptosis. Why might you need a tumor suppressor gene? Well, because this proto-oncogene has mutated into a what? Mutated. What? Into a oncogene. And it's coding for bad proteins. And an example of a bad protein was the RAS protein. Remember we said RAS is like stepping on the gas? And proto-oncogenes they encourage the cell cycle, okay? Now, normally, they do it when it needs to be on. Hey, it's time to do the cell cycle. It's time to do the cell cycle, you know? But once they mutate into oncogenes, they're like, go, go, cell cycle, cell cycle, cell cycle, go. And as long as you have tumor suppressor genes to kill that cell off, you'd be okay, right? Shut it down, repair it, or fix it. 
but when you get cancer is when the proto-oncogene has mutated into an oncogene and your tumor suppressor genes have mutated. That's when you get cancer because you are in fact stepping on the gas and you do not have any brakes. Okay, and you're going into an intersection. That's the difference between the two genes. Okay, um, so characteristics of cancer cells, the difference between the two genes, look at the ways like your additional objective, like I think that's very interesting on ways to avoid getting cancer. I think that'd be something to know. I don't know, yeah. Okay, any other clarifying questions? Do you feel smarter? You should say thank you to these people that are in this room right now because they are here for you so you can listen to this video. But don't stay up too late because you need a large mammalian brain for tomorrow and um, have a piece of toast. Okay, good? All right. Stop.